Hello students, I welcome you to today's online GC based online tutorial. Um, last time we started this very topic, structure of business. So today we'll be looking at the concluding part of it. I am gracious Abaku. In our last class, uh, we talked on organizational structure. We also talked on, I also discussed on organizational charts. So where I was able to show us um, a typical example of an organizational chart, where we discuss the functions or the importance of organizational charts. Now, in that explanation, you know, we found I found we found out that in an organization, you know, people's roles, functions, they are well defined. It makes it very easy for people to understand what is expected of them and what you know they are supposed to do. All right, today we'll be looking at the concluding part of it. Our objective first is to define authority, define power, define span of control, explain delegation of authority, state the advantages of delegation of authority, and lastly, to state the disadvantages of delegation of authority. Now, the term authority sometimes is confused for power. However, there is a slight difference between authority and power. Now, what makes it different here is that authority, most of the time, they are legitimate, they are approved, they are well recognized and accepted. But when it comes to power, you know, people might have, for instance, there's someone who has a gun and he's able to command obedience with his gun. The source of that person's power is the gun. Okay? Now, when it comes to authority here, the person has the rights to command obedience. It can be his office. Let's say, for instance, in a school setting where we have a principal, I sometimes you realize that the principal might be older than some of the staff. But the office in this case has given this principal the power to enforce obedience from this subordinates. Now, let's look at the term authority. Authority can be defined as power which has legitimacy. Like I said, it is approved, it is accepted, and it is recognized. It is a right to give command. Now, someone who has a gun and then points a gun at someone to command obedience, that person might not have the right at that moment to shoot. But the gun he has, you know, is that source of his power. But in this case, someone who has authority has that right to command or give directive or to ensure compliance. It can also be referred to as an instrument of office or anything that enables individuals to secure obedience from other person. The principal, the office is superior to every other office in a school setting. Hence, every other person will definitely subject themselves to the authority that emanates from that office of a principal. Now let's look at the term power. Power here entails the ability to influence and to compel obedience. Now, people who are muscular, for instance, you know, because they have that strength, they have that energy, they can easily command obedience. They can compel obedience from people. Now, you know, they are powerful in the sense that they can easily oppress those who are not as powerful as they are. I believe you can get the difference between this power and authority. Now, someone who has a gun can easily command or compel someone to obey. Now, in this case, the person that is obeying is not obeying that person because the person is in you know, the person's height or body. No, the person is obeying because of what? The gun. There are many sources of power. Now, since to have power is the ability to change the behavior or attitude of other individuals through having the means of sanctioning them, the power of an officer is derived from an authority given to him. All right, let's write on. Now, let's look at accountability. In a school setting, 
you know, we have the principal, the, the vice principal administration, and the vice principal academics. Now, these two vice principal, they are accountable to the principal. The principal, in this case, is probably accountable to, let's say, a superior power that is over him. Now, in this case, from time to time, the vice principal will definitely report to the principal. The principal as well will report to the superior authority that is over him. So in this case, accountability entails reporting to a superior authority by a subordinate. Here it says, accountability is simply, simply means a situation whereby a subordinate is accountable to a superior in an organization for his action and he is obliged to report to his superior how well he has discharged his responsibilities and use the authority delegated to him now this will now lead us to responsibility responsibility can be defined as the individual obligation to carry out the duties assigned to him or her in a school setting okay a class teacher his responsibility is to maintain order in a class. Now, in this case, it is the responsibility of the class teacher to ensure that the class is tidy, the students are well behaved, the students are doing or they are sitting on the right seats. These are the responsibility of the class teacher, maintaining order in a class. Now, it is the ability of a person to be called upon to account for the action and result from assigned duty. Now, sometimes the class in question might be called upon to, you know, you know um, give accounts of his class or the behaviors of the student in a class. So also it is for like, the managers or let's say the HOD who will definitely give an account of his subordinates. Now, let's look at span of control. Span of control here is trying to talk about the number of people that is under the control of a particular management. And the span of control or span of management refers to the number of subordinates a manager can effectively control or number of subordinates working with him. Now, in order to ensure effectiveness, this is the reason why there has to be control. Like a school setting, like I said, where we have the principal, the vice principal, the HOD. Now, these are heads. But in terms of authority, the authority we have the higher authority, which is the principal, we have the lesser authority, which is the HOD. Now, the entire staff of the school, they are under the principal. Then the staff of, let's say, social science, they are under the HOD of social science. So you see, in this case, the uh, hierarchy here, you know, uh, here, once span of control is stated, okay, in the sense that a manager can only be allowed con con to control the number of people that he has the ability and the mental capacity to handle. Now, there are many factors that can actually determine one's span of control. Sometimes it can be one's leadership style, it can be one's uh, mental capacity, it can be one's education qualification or uh, background, as the case may be. There are many factors that are responsible. And sometimes it can be, let's say, the, the size of the organization. That as suggested by her inferior, span of control should be limited to between three and six. So which to say, under a particular management, for instance, the number of subordinates should not exceed six, okay, so as to make it very easy for the manager to control and for efficiency and effectiveness sake. Now let's look at delegation of authority. If a principal of a school, for instance, let's say has an outside function and because he has so much at hand to do and he's unable to attain that outside function 
And for that reason, he has to transfer his authority or his power or responsibility to, to let's say, one of the vice principals. In this case, we can say there is a delegation of authority. Now, a delegation of authority is the transfer of responsibility to a subordinate with sufficient authority to enable the subordinate to carry out the assignment. Now, sufficient authority here, there are cases where a superior might delegate uh, responsibility to a subordinate and let's say the superior might not be too okay with the subordinate for reasons best known to him. He probably might not let the subordinate know everything that he's supposed to know to enable him to carry out this task. As we go further, we get to see reasons why we might have what we call insufficient authority in terms of delegation of authority. Now, the truth here is that irrespective of the subordinates or irrespective of who the, who the management okay, or the manager decide to delegate responsibility to, now, here is that the superior will definitely consider himself accountable for whatever responsibility he seems to have delegated. Now, the greater the extent, you see, the greater must be the extent to which delegation of authority is practiced. So, let's move on. Now, we have some of the principles of delegation. First, the more the clarity in the function. Clarity here, the term clarity here means clear. So the functions, okay, in this case, has to be very clear. Now, responsibility cannot be delegated. So which is to say, if a principal should delegate a, a, a task to, let's say, a vice principal, though, if the vice principal is able to carry it out successfully, or very well, the glory or the blame goes to the principal because the responsibility ought to be executed or implemented or to be carried out by the principal. Three, the more the balance of authority, responsibility, and accountability in organization, which is to say it has to be what? Balance in everything when it comes to authority responsibility and accountability it should not be abused then we have command must be clearly specified yes when giving out or, or when delegating a task to a subordinate what is expected of that subordinate must be clearly stated by the superior. It's the same as the first one, where we have gem of the clarity in the functions. All right. Now let's look at some of the advantages of delegation of authority. First is reduction of burden of work. Now, when there is delegation of authority, the task is reduced. Training of subordinates, yes. While a subordinate is being assigned a certain task, he tends to acquire more knowledge about that very task he probably has not carried out before. Then it saves time, yes, it saves time. You know, the principal or the manager cannot do everything at the same time. So in this case, by the time he delegates part of his responsibility, you see that time will be, you know, saved. Then we have speedy execution of a job, yes, which is to say things will be done faster. It, it makes smooth succession possible. Now let me explain this part. You know, there are times people retire from office, okay? Now, you know, from the experience or the experience that the subordinates may have acquired as a result of carrying out certain tasks that was delegated to him or her, Okay, if the manager should retire or something happens to the manager, it becomes very easy for the subordinate to take over the position or office of the manager. So, in this case, there won't be problem for succession. Three, six, we have ensure cordial relationship. Yes, when a superior delegates his authority from time to time to his subordinates, you see that there is going to be what? a cordial relationship. 
it motivates subordinates. You know, it's just like um, when you when someone is given that privilege of doing what his boss does. That moment, the the respect, okay, that moment, whatever uh, that will be accorded to the superior is accorded to the uh, subordinates. At that moment, that the subordinate is trying to implement the task that is given to him. Let's say a teacher, for instance, is being, assume, is, is being asked to assume the office of a principal for a day. On that very day, he might be seen as acting principal, but the, the respect, the accolades, the, the, the uh, privileges of a principal that he is going to get on that very day is definitely going to motivate him to do more because that might just be his only chance of you know staying there or let's say as time goes by he might have that privilege of being awarded because of the subordinate's ability to execute the task that was given to him very well now let's look at some of the disadvantages of delegation of authority the first is unfinished task. Now, insufficient delegation, remember we're talking about insufficient authority. Insufficient delegation may lead to unfinished task. You know, we have some of these corny managers, okay? Now, by the time they give our task to subordinates, for reasons best known to them, they might not make it clear to the subordinates as to what to do. Now, in this case, it becomes very difficult for the subordinates to finish the task. Then we have delegation can be abused. I just mentioned about a, uh, a teacher being asked to assume the office of a principal. Let's say something about the principal. Now, in this case, there is that tendency for the teacher to abuse that privilege. Okay, so there is that tendency for authority to be abused. Then we have delegation may affect the quality of job. Now, in this case, the subordinate might not have a complete knowledge or understanding of the task that is assigned to him. Now, this might affect the quality of the job. In the sense that the principal or the principal, as the case may be, or the manager might have a good understanding, a good knowledge of what to do. But in the case of the subordinates, he has little or no knowledge. So in this case, the quality of the task or the job might not be satisfactory enough. Then we have it may lead to confusion. We have delegation may lead to confusion if authority and responsibility is not properly defined or stated. Yes, if a subordinate is not clear as to what is expected of him, definitely he might be confused and may not carry out the task very well. Now, let's look at reasons why a manager may not delegate authority. The first is fear of expressing favoritism among the subordinates. If, as a manager, you decide to choose any of your subordinates to carry out a task, now the rest might see that, okay, might think that there is what we call favoritism. Maybe the, the manager is trying to favor one over the other. Then fear of subordinates making costly mistakes, yes. You know, remember I made mention of the fact that if a manager should delegate a, a task to his subordinates, the manager will take both the glory and also he will take, uh, let's say, both the glory and also the responsibility. So if the manager or if the subordinate does not carry out the task properly, if there is a mistake, the manager will definitely bear the consequences because this is the office of the manager. Now, the fear of subordinates taking over their jobs, yes, a manager might feel that, okay, if I should ask the subordinates to 
carry out this task. There are cases where you see a subordinate having more knowledge than the manager or the superior. So in this case, the superior might be afraid that, oh, if I should ask my subordinate to carry out this task, he might, you know, be of favored over him in the eyes of, let's say, the boss. Okay, so the managers, they are often careful when it comes to delegating responsibilities. All right, sometimes due to lack of capital subordinates, yes, they might have a new intake, okay, who they believe might not be able to handle the task. So in this case, you see that they do not delegate responsibilities. Five, the fear of subordinates performing better than the boss. Six, the fear of the subordinates knowing better than the boss. So these things, have, one way or the other, may hinder a manager from delegating a responsibility. All right, we have our um, communication. As we know, that communication has to do with the transfer of information or dissemination of message okay from the sender to the receiver now let's look at the flow of communication in an organization we have the interdepartmental communication now let's say we have the hod or what we have or what is called um, the science department we have the art department and we have the commercial department so when information flows from arts to commercial or to science. In this case, we can say it is interdepartmental. You know, in every organization, we have different units where communication can flow. So interdepartmental communication is the process of sending and receiving messages of information from one department to another within an organization. There are various means by which communication can flow within an organization. Now, when we have communication flow within a department, within a unit, this is what we refer to as intra-departmental communication. Okay, this involves the sending and receiving information within the department of an organization. Now let's look at let's look at the importance of communication to a business. Why is communication important to a business? It bridges the gap between the top management and the subordinates. Okay, so communication bridges that gap between the top and the management, so that no one is left or no one will act in ignorance. Two, it provides permanent record for reference purposes. Now, one of the ways by which uh, we can have correspondence or communication flow in organization is where we have a written information that can be passed across to the staff. So in this case, this can be kept for reference purposes. Three, it helps to organize human and other resources in the most effective way. Yes, there is orderliness in the organization. It establishes and disseminates the goals of an enterprise. Now, one of the way of making the goal, the vision, the missions of a business, of a firm, known to subordinate is true communication. Communication enables the subordinates to know what is expected of them. We have communication makes it possible for the day-to-day -day activities to be easily attended to. All right, this is uh, where we'll end today's class. So this is an assignment for you. Uh, the assignment is from SSCE 1990. It says, what is delegation of authority? And state for advantages of delegation of authority. So thank you so much for your attention. And remember to stay safe so that by the time school resumes fully, you all look hey and hearty. Thanks for your time and catch you next week. Goodbye.